We thank you for taking the time to be with us at C3. We hope you enjoy today's message. We are in a study in Exodus that, that I've entitled, We're Out of Here. And this morning we are at the exit of ex- Exodus. It's the time when they actually leave. And when you think about Exodus, you know, it's, it's one of the, the books together with Deuteronomy um, that, that tells really the, the story. And when you add creation to it and you add Leviticus to it, it the, 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 uh, the Jewish religion and faith believes that everything that there is to know about God in his creation, his rescue, his um, provision is all found in that first story, that first five books. And, and we know that Moses is the one who is the author. And, and this morning, what we're finding is that Today's portion in chapter 14 talks a lot about how people break free. For a little over 430 years, it seemed like God wasn't available, that he was distant, that he didn't hear, that he didn't care. And Israel, having gone from a nation of two, Abraham and Sarah, to three, to, you know, to 14 all the way to 75 into now over 600,000 men. They estimate about 1.25 to 1.5 million people left on, on, uh, on that particular time frame uh, right after the Passover. And it became such an important time because Israel came to the conclusion that this cycle of of bondage, of slavery, of darkness, was finally broken. And it creates such a celebration. And it was was so important that God made this the beginning of every year. They were supposed to celebrate this every year and celebrate it for a week. You know, we talked in weeks past. Can you imagine if like July 4th was like a week long? Imagine the parties in America. I mean, no work and something sacred on the beginning, something sacred on the end, and then just blow out eating. And, and I mean, there would be, it, it wouldn't, you couldn't contain it. But, but the purpose of this was God wanted them to celebrate the fact that, that they are free and they are different. And the nation begins what, what the Bible will call this big, long word called sanctification. They get set apart. And they become the picture of God's people being set apart and what that looks like in real life and real time. And then what it looks like for us, what happens when we break free out of this satanic world system where world, what world powers do? They oppress people. They overwork them, they overtax them, and they overdominate them. Then all of us in the 21st century doesn't matter where you live, can all say amen. I don't know about you, but I don't like being overtaxed. I hate taxes. And I don't like when, when government steps in and tells us what we have to do, the way we have to do it, and takes that position of heavy-handedness. Imagine that for hundreds and hundreds of years, where at least in our form of government, we have a say, we have a voice, so they say. They had no voice, so they cry out to their creator. In the midst of all of these gods, in the midst of an emperor who believes that he is all-powerful, he is the provider of his people. And Moses is called by God and told, Go out in front of the people, go tell Pharaoh it's time for the people to come out. And 400 years is enough. And we've walked through a period where Moses approaches Pharaoh and says, look, here's what God has said, and God wants you to let the people go so they can go worship him. And Pharaoh in chapter 5 says, who is this God? I don't know him, nor will I listen to him. 
you don't get to go anywhere, go back to work. And without knowing it, Pharaoh invites God into a battle. And over the next 11 and a half months and 10 plagues, God will wipe away almost every memory of the power of Egypt and of Pharaoh. And this morning, they are on their exit, and we will pick that up as they are breaking free once and for all. But we're going to discover something in the story is that when you break free from the world, sometimes the world comes chasing after you. And it's an ongoing saga throughout this journey that we call faith as we move from one world to the next world. So if you have your Bibles, we are in chapter 14, verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, and he says, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp before Piharahoth, between Migdal and the sea. You shall camp in front of Baal Zephon, opposite it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say, to, will, will say of the sons of Israel, they're wandering aimlessly. Underline that, circle it, star it. In the land, in the wilderness, and it has shut them in. And God says, therefore I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them, and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord and they did so. Now, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, what is this we've done that we've let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready, and he took his people with him, and he took 600 select chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. We'll stop there. So here's the picture. Israel is on the exit, and they're kind of living large. They feel like they're in charge. They are free. They've watched the devastation. There's very little left of Egypt. Stuff's been eaten, stuff's been destroyed, they've watched hail destroy crops, they've watched what the hail didn't destroy, the locust eat, they've watched flies come in, they've had gnats, they've watched the firstborn, all of that. It is decimated, and out they go, and on top of that, every one of their neighbors is giving them silver and gold with a kind of a gentle get out. And so they're walking out, man, and they are jacked. They are pumped. There is nothing that can stop them. Look what God has done. Look who we are. They're on their way out. So they're journeying when all of a sudden God's going to say something to Moses. He says, hey, I want you to turn around. Turn back. And I want you to, to kind of camp right up against the Red Sea. Turn back. So imagine what it looks like as well over a million to a million and a half people are walking and turning, it's not one straight line. It's going to look like, you know, some kind of crazy little ant farm of people just moving all over the place. And Pharaoh has numerous outposts all along the, the coast and in the interior, so they're kind of watching and reporting as to what's going on. And and if you're a person from Israel and you're doing all of this and you really don't have a, a strong foundation in who God is, you're trusting Moses and Aaron and you really kind of at times kind of really wonder about Moses and Aaron. And they really, really know what they're doing. I mean, seriously. So they, they're told to turn around and this is where we start to find some things happening in your outlines, you can pull them out in our passage because some funny things happen when it comes to, to breaking free. We discover some truths that, uh, that, that kind of jump out at us here. And the, and the first one is right in verses 1 through 3, and it's this. God uses some pretty odd strategies to free his people, wouldn't you say? 
All throughout Scripture, God does some bizarre things. I mean, how many people remember in Judges uh, the story of Gideon? All right, Gideon's this dude, and he's like from this tribe of nobody, and he's like the nobody, like the captain of nobodies. So he's the dorkiest of the dorky. You know, he is the weirdest, most awkward of the group. So you would never pick him. He's probably, you know, five foot nothing and a hundred nothing. And so God calls him and says, look, here's the deal. The Midianites have been coming, and it's about time that, that we're going to deal with them. And, and, and so Gideon goes to this whole story, and, and he rallies 22,000 troops. So 22,000 are going to fight about 120,000, it appears. And God looks at Gideon and says, okay, we got one problem. you got too many people. you got way too many people. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down by the river, and I want you to tell the people to get a drink. And here's how you're going to pick the people. And how does he finally pick the people? Whoever, like, puts the water in their hands and drinks it, those are the people that are good. The people that, that stick their face down and lap it out of the water, that's, you know, they're, they're no good. Tell them to go home. And anybody that's got kids, anybody's a free. And so before you know, 22,000 becomes 300. How many people go, that's like a stupid, that, that's not the way you win. Kind of odd. You know, why would you turn back when you just left? Israel should be hightailing it to Mount Sinai, onto the promised land. Not turning around and kind of wandering aimlessly. Do you ever feel in your own life at times that in the Christian walk you can kind of wander aimlessly? Just, I'm not, I'm not really sure where I'm going, I guess. This sounds kind of odd. It's just a little different. It, it's just feels like you're kind of out in the wilderness. Well, that has a tendency to look very confusing to the place you just came out of. Pharaoh looks, his captains look, and they go, you know what? The life that these people are living looks pretty weird. They just seem to be wandering like, they don't know where they're going. It's kind of confusing. It becomes a head-scratcher. So naturally, the inclination is they don't know what they're doing. And their God isn't real. Bring them back. See, sometimes for us, our life looks really confusing to the world that we've come out of. It becomes kind of those head-scratching moments for the world. They, they wonder what the heck you're doing, and why you're doing what you're doing. I mean, think back to, to your own life, and everybody here is at, at different places in their, in their walk with the Lord, but think back to the times when you first came to Christ, you know, and you're kind of all jacked up, you're charged up, and, you know, it's like the greatest thing you've, you've done in your life, and, and, you know, if you had friendship groups, I, I remember my group, um, you know, I, I, my, my group of friends were like going, man, you lost your stinking mind. You know, what, what do you mean you're not drinking anymore? What do you mean you're going to church? What do you mean you bought a Bible? What the heck are you doing? And, and what happened to the real Greg Mizek? Where did he go? I, I don't get this. See, Pharaoh and the world doesn't get. It's very, very confusing on what we do and why we do what we do. You know, the, the, the lifestyle changes is what creates confusion and appears we're walking aimlessly in our world. Choices to purity. You know, when you live in a world where you know, sex outside of marriage is as common as anything anymore, what do you mean that you're, you're choosing to remain a virgin or you're going to choose secondary virginity? doesn't make sense. Why, why, why are you returning something you found? You found a wallet and there was $500 in it and you, you sent the money back in the wallet. Why don't you send the wallet back and keep the cash? It doesn't make sense. It becomes somewhat confusing. Generosity, sacrifice, service, 
giving, all of those things that, that, that the lifestyle change creates. The way that we relate to one another, the way that we, the way that we do community, the way that we offer forgiveness rather than hold offense. All of those things create confusing. I think one of the greatest parts of my job as a pastor is to watch the lifestyle changes in the people here at C3 because it becomes real. And just like Israel, it creates confusion in the world. It appears that we're wandering aimlessly, but what happens at times when we first come out of the world is God will lead us to a place, turn us around, and say, sit here and wait for a while. Just still yourself. See, the Christian life was always designed, especially as the early church fathers, first century, second century, always believed that there was, there was to be a pace of Christianity that was slow, that wasn't in a rat race, that the day, the week, the month, the year, the calendar, it all moved around this rhythm of the life of Christ. Moving from incarnation to crucifixion, resurrection, Pentecost, moves all the way around. So the life gets focused. And a lot of that time, by the way, is downtime. You know what makes American society nervous? Downtime. It's the thing that we desire the most, but fight against oftentimes in our life. And anybody who's ever gone out of the country gets this. It takes you, the times that we've gone to Tobago, man, life doesn't happen. I remember Pastor Frank saying to me, you know, the time is our ally, but it's your enemy. Because you try to do as much as you can in time and do all these things. We, 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 the one thing that we understand is work's going to always be there tomorrow. That's why it took them 25 years to build a school. <laughs> but we don't. And so we're always on the move. So he has them sit and it confuses the world. Second thing that we find in Breaking Free is God does what he does for his own glory. God does what he does for his own glory. Look at verse 4. Thus I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after you guys. How, how about like if you're Moses? Oh, yeah, I don't like that so much. I don't like him chasing after me. So here he comes. And he's coming after you, and I will be honored or glorified through Pharaoh and his armies. And now the Egyptians, the arch enemy, have an opportunity to know I am the Lord. So everyone's going to get this picture. So what we have to remember is, back in chapter 5, Pharaoh says to Moses, go tell your God, never heard of him, don't know who he is, am not listening. So guess what God is doing? He's introducing himself to Pharaoh with the, how do you like me now? You, don't want, you still don't want to listen? Okay, I will be honored, glorified through you. The one thing we have to understand about God as this triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, is they will give their glory to no one else. They won't share it. And when it's contested, God will always show up. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans in chapter 11, verse 36, makes that very statement about the glory of God and how cyclical it really is when he makes the statement, for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory. God pours out his goodness, his presence, his glory. All that he is, he pours it out. It comes from him. So everyone benefits 
grace, God's goodness, everybody who's alive experiences whether or not they acknowledge who God is. He really at that moment doesn't care. It is his consent of creation. He's created it. It's for all. I consent to it. It has its own rhythm, its own cycles. If you acknowledge it, great. If you don't, that's on you. So it goes from him. Then everything that God does, it moves through him. So rescue and salvation and provision and restoration and release and all the healing, everything that is God, it comes through him. We get into trouble when we want it to come through something else. So Israel is resting. Egypt is learning. The world is watching. Everything is a stage. And God reminds us everything here he has a cycle for. So it comes through him, we realize in the New Testament, that it's when he puts on flesh and blood. It opens this all up for a personal experience. As not only Christ will give his life for us, he will step in our place for us, but then he will put the very presence of God in us so then everything that we do goes back to him and ultimately brings glory and honor to him. Paul blows me away with how he even got that. Starts with God, it moves through God, touches us, goes back to God. People may not think that going out and painting somebody's house, mowing somebody's yard, given a buck for a water well, that that has any kind of bearing at all. You know, we, we sing the song that God's going to do great things through us. And what we, we don't understand is God gives his glory to no one else. So everything we do, it's already been set up. All you got to do is step out and do it. You don't do anything great because you're great. That's the conventional wisdom of America. You don't do anything great because you're great. You do great things because God is great, and he set it up for each individual. How he does this and what the schematic in heaven looks like, have no idea, but it's got to look like some kind of massive Geico commercial blackboard with all kinds of equations. But all you do is you take a step out. So some way, somehow... A church like this could do something in a water well that changes a life, that changes one person who would have died, who becomes a leader of a nation, who you have no idea. And guess what happens? Whether you gave a buck, a penny, or a thousand bucks, it gets credited to your account. And who gets the glory? Why? Because it came from him, it operated through him, and it goes back to him. So he says to Moses on the front end of this, watch how in something as simple as this, I'm going to bait the enemy to come right to you. And watch what I do. Probably looked very similar on a night that was pretty much like any other night. Jesus has a meal Passover meal, walks out into a garden, they start praying, he looks out, and there's a long line of people carrying torches. He's pinned in a garden, there's no escape. Satan thinks that he has him, he's going to pin him to a cross, and God just keeps pulling the enemy because that's how he'll bring glory to himself. Kind of a cool story. Third, got to understand our old life will always chase after us. Never stops. Look at verse 5, moving forward. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants said, we must be stupid What are we doing? We've let them go from serving us. We lost our workforce. 
You know, that means we got nobody to pick on. We've got to do the work, and there ain't hardly anybody left. Let's go get them. So he made his chariots ready, took his people with him, 600 select chariots, all the other chariots with officers over him. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and like a moron, that's not in there, he chased after the sons of Israel, and the sons, as the sons of Israel were going out boldly. They've heard Israel wandering around, aimlessly wandering. They don't know where they're going. They're lost. This was a mistake. They really shouldn't have done it. You know what? Let's go get them, bring, bring them back. Everything will be as it was. That's the old world. That's the old man. The old life will always contest your freedom. It doesn't want to let you go. It will pop up at different times in your life. There's always going to be times. Sometimes it's five years down the road. Sometimes it's 20 years down the road. Sometimes it's 30 years down the road. Sometimes it's 40 or 50 years down the road. There's always going to be the temptation to look back. To maybe want to go back. And the reason for this is there are times where life happens, and it happens hard. You can be just like Israel walking out boldly. Yea, God. Championing all your verses. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do everything. I remember those days. I remember sitting there thinking when I was first a, a, a first came to Christ, I, I read that you know you could pray and have this tree and uprooted and this mountain could move. And thought, how cool would that be? You know, until you realize that's not what he's saying. You know, you're you're not saved to be God. And so all of a sudden, life starts to happen, and it brings us to us our next point in breaking free is. The life of faith can really be a difficult life. The life of faith can be a very difficult life. I've said it numerously here that I really believe that Christianity is just a, a set of complex simplicity, very simple principles that live out really complex because they involve you doing something. Christianity preaches really well to other people. It doesn't preach really well to yourself. There are places in our life where we get blind. We want to tell everybody what they should do. We want to tell everybody. We want to point to the world, tell how wrong they are. But you know what? We never want that to come and be pointed and the light shining on us. Christianity gets very difficult when life gets real. For example, after you're journeying for a while and life starts to unfold with things like jobs and your job gets really difficult and you don't like the people at your job, you don't like the cubicle people next to you, or the employer says we are going to be closing this company and moving it somewhere else, and you begin to wonder, what am I supposed to do about that? Or you find yourself in dating relationships and you're wondering, is this the person I'm supposed to marry or not? And you try to figure it out, is this the person that God would have me as if God really does in fact care? And we start trying to figure all this out and you go, oh my gosh, and then we come to the conclusion that, yeah, it might be good, and then you marry the person and go, I hate this person. I want out. God, why did you bring this person into my life? And life starts to get really hard. Person doesn't meet your needs. 
Or maybe that person's life and the cycle of life that they have is interfering with yours. But yet, you're trying to follow the Lord and going, God, what is this? I don't, I don't get this. Or finances start to pile up. And you've learned the lesson of credit and that when you swipe your card, you have to pay it back. And you've swiped your card so many times and you've bought so many things that what you bring in doesn't match what goes out. And you're wondering, what are we supposed to do? Or you sit back and you discover as you're aging, you're watching your parents age. And you watch their health, their mental state begin to fail. And you have to make decisions over your parents. You begin to wonder, God, what is this all about? I thought when... I went to the revival meeting and I watched TV. The guy said, Christianity is a wonderful life and God's going to give everything you ever wanted. And he's not giving me anything. I'm in a state of difficulty. The temptation is to look back, to look somewhere else, to look to someone else, to look for something else. Life will always come chasing after us. It doesn't let go. So, here's where the story gets good. Israel, who is now one moment walking boldly, watch what happens when life gets difficult. The Lord have hardened the heart of Pharaoh, verse 8, the king of Egypt, and he chased after the sons of Israel, and all the sons of Israel were going out boldly, the Egyptians chased after them with all their horses and chariots, with Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and they overtook them camping at the sea beside pi Harahoth in front of baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. Now they're not so bold anymore, are they? And Israel cries out to the Lord. Imagine what 1.5 million people sound like as they're going... So once the initial, ah, comes out, somebody has to be blamed for the misery. Then they said to Moses, here we go, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word? Back in chapter 5, we told you, saying, leave us alone. It would have been better for us to have served the Egyptians. Somebody's got to be blamed. I didn't think this was going to go like this. And there's people in here. And all of us at different times in our life are going to deal with this. Where real things happen Real situations occur. Real questions to God. Why are you letting this happen to me? Why? And you're, you're hemmed in. And there doesn't appear to be a way out that your deliverance, your situation, whatever you're dealing with, you're stuck, your back's against a wall, and this is approaching you. And now you've got to do something. And now Moses will flip this. Moses will answer them, not with, hey, shut up, I don't know, he just told me to bring you out here, get off my back. Moses, like all of us, is, is a person who was called to lead. We all lead, whether we lead one person, whether we lead a family, whether we lead a coworker, whether we lead a, a business, whether we lead a whole bunch of people, whether you lead one or you lead a million. What God does is God always makes sure that we're just a chapter ahead. 
When I first went in the ministry, I used to think that it was my responsibility to know everything about God so that all the questions that people would ask, I would have the answers, and it scared the living daylights out of me because I really didn't. And so you seek it advice, and other people who are doing the same thing say, well, just, you know, just make stuff up. I mean, because nobody really knows until you come to this conclusion. He only tells you just enough. The leader is just out far enough from the followers, the people he's leading, to say, this is where we're going, this is what I know, this is what we do, and the rest of it, it's up to God. So let's just see what he does. Now watch what Moses does here. Because Moses is going to give all of us some practical steps on how we break free from the cycles of life that we get stuck in so that we keep moving forward. And his, right here, becomes some of the most profound statements ever made in all of Scripture. And so if you're stuck in a cycle, stuck in a habit, stuck in something that's painful, stuck in wondering what God is doing, watch what he says, and we're going to walk through this, because these become really, really, really important to us. They don't sound like much, by the way. But watch what Moses says in response to Egypt wanting to go back and just surrender and give up and go back to the old way of life. Verse 13, Moses says to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation, some may have deliverance, of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians... Whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. That's kind of cool. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. We'll stop there. So, some key steps here in this little kind of unpacking section on deliverance and breaking free from like the cycles of just bad life, of bad living, when the world comes chasing after you. The first one that I'm going to give you is a a kind of a blanket statement, and then the rest are kind of actual steps that we can, because what God will always do to us is God will say, here is the principle, now here's what you have to do in order for this to happen to you and become very personal to you. The first one is this. God will always come to your rescue. That's what he's telling Moses. Tell the people, I'm on my way. Don't panic, don't panic. I got all this. Understand exactly what I'm doing. They don't have a clue. But you know, again, one of our central passages in Exodus isn't from Exodus. It's from Isaiah 55, verse 8, when God would say, my ways are not like your ways and my thoughts are not like your thoughts, in verse 8 of chapter 55. So they have no idea. Moses, by the way, has no idea what God is going to do. So all that God wants the people to know, all he wants us to know is this. I will come and I will rescue you. Once you understand that, everything else becomes very practical in what we do in everyday living. See, we get caught up with things. That we always think that sin, this small little word, is wrongdoing. Sin, as it's defined in the scripture, is missing the mark. Sin is not wrongdoing. Sin is wrong being. It's when we are not who we were called to be, we miss God's mark. And therefore, fall short of what he has for us. From him, through him, to him, that he gets the glory. So we have to understand, look, this isn't something that you go, okay, well, just stop doing this and God will do this. This is understand who you are and the life of Christ that is in you. Let that now begin to rescue you because whether it's Moses or whether it's Jesus Christ on the cross, the story's the same. He's taking us out of our bondage. 
He comes to us to take us out of what we're dealing with. All we have to do is go forward. Second thing he says, always stand firm. Now, standing is a pretty interesting kind of concept here. He says, look, you don't have to do anything but stand. Now, you will, standing's kind of a dumb thing unless you grew up a football fan or played football. How many people know that the quarterback loves when the left tackle stands firm? When he gives the ole block, not so fun. Standing firm, the best, and I remember fourth grade St. Luke's JV football. I remember being told, and I was a, a, a receiver, that you know when you're learning how to block, the best thing you do is you stand in somebody's way. And just keep standing in their way. Wherever they go, stand in their way. Stand in their way. Stand in their way. Make sure your base is nice and wide so you don't get run over. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to stand firm, right? Just stand. His word here is stand by. So we stand by the Lord and we watch what he's doing. We don't have to do anything other than stand by get ready to go forward. Don't look back and go backward. So just kind of hang in there and stand. Because when you are standing, you are actually engaging the enemy in one of the most profound offensive weapons you have. You are resisting the temptation to quit and give up. Ever know anybody that goes, you know what? I've had it with God. I'm giving up. I quit. Anybody know anybody that ever quit on a marriage, quit on a job, quit on their home? Standing becomes phenomenal. It is both an offensive and defensive weapon. You get to the book of Ephesians, what does Paul say? Having done everything else, stand. Stand firm in your faith. Put on all the armor and stand. Stand by. You know, you don't have to go like looking to kill anybody. Just stand, resist the temptation, know who God is, use your shield, understand the truth, all of the stuff that goes with that, just understand because when you do go forward, you always go forward in peace, not chaos. It might look like chaos, it may look like wandering, but you go forth in the wholeness of God. Next. He's going to say, choose faith in the face of fear. Now, Moses is very afraid, I will say that, as is Israel, as would you be if you were significantly outnumbered and had no weapons and people were charging at you with chariots and you know the device. You're backed up against the wall. There's nothing you can do. And he acknowledges the fact that Israel scared to death. He didn't say, man, stop yelling at me. You guys have been yelling at me since chapter 5. And you know what? You're going to be yelling at me all the way to chapter 36. Get off my back. Not heads. Just, he, he's doing the same thing. He goes, okay, just wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Just stand by and let's watch what God does. Let's not grab the wheel and take control. Let's stand and just see what he's going to do here. And some of us in our life, we have some real reasons to be fearful. Real issues of marriage and disease and finances, and problematic kids, parental declines, all the things that, are, that cause fear. But Moses says, look, we're not going to go backwards. We're not going to go back. We're just going to stand by here, and we're going to move forward a little bit in this, and we're going to watch what God does. And Moses goes on to say, the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again forever. And this is important because it brings us to our next step, and it's this. Never, ever in your life consider your enemy as an ally. Don't ever consider your enemy as an ally. Go forward, not back. 
See, the old man with all his ways, the old woman, they're dead in Christ, is what we know in the New Testament. Any man or woman that is in Christ is a new creation. The old nature is, is dead, but however, you're still encased in it. See, what we have to understand is this. We live in a, in a constant state of temptation to go back. And unless we understand this principle, we are going to kind of be the three-step forward, two-step back people. See, we're all, all of us are one decision away from the old life. For me, it would be one drink. For some, it might be one site on, a, on, a, on the internet. For some, it's one cigarette. For some, it's one person. We're all one decision away from going backwards and going back to the old way. Why? Because the old man is comfortable in Egypt. The old woman, comfortable. Maybe not so much, but the reality of what's known is always comfortable there. And finally, I love this. Never underestimate the power of obedience. This is for all of us who are Moses is out there. So, all Moses has to do is pay attention and do. So he says, the Lord says in verse 15, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the, the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, Moses, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. What? What do you mean? Take your staff, lift it up, stretch it out, and I'll do the rest. What? I don't get to do anything like lightning doesn't come out of it or nothing? It don't turn into a snake? Thought this was going to be really cool? See, sometimes all we have to do is the simple thing. The obedient thing. God already tells you what to do. You get the decision whether or not to do it. He does that. It divides. What becomes life for one, our baptismal identity, walking through the water we'll find, will become judgment and death for someone else. But some guy out front has to be the person who says, all right, I'm going to do exactly what you tell. You know, it's kind of a dumb thing to do. Pick up a staff. I know the staff. Stretch it out. Stretch it out. And watch what happens. So here's what God does. He goes, now I'll handle the rest. So what does he do? The pillar of fire comes around from the front side, comes around between, and builds this massive wall of fire. So on one side, here's Israel under complete light. But yet with the fire, what we find is it says Israel's in the complete darkness. Watch how this plays out. He says, I'm going to harden, as for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of Pharaoh of Egypt. So they're going to go in after you, after I, I part the sea. Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots, his horsemen, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, although they're going to be swimming for their life. They won't really figure it out until it's too late. Then the Egyptians will know uh, all of their stuff is going to be done. Then the angel of God, who had been going before the camp, moves around, went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them, stood behind them. So they've got fire. They've got a cloud block in the light. And it's dark on one side, and it gave great light at night. And Moses did what he did, and we know they walk through, and Egyptian, and the fire moves out, and here comes Pharaoh. They go through, it all falls on them, and they drown to death. Israel goes through on dry land, and everyone's, yay God. And what has happened? The cycle of bondage at that point in their history, broken. Really simple. They didn't have to do a whole lot. They had to leave. They had to walk. They had to wait. They had to stand. They had to watch. They had to trust. And they had to obey. Sounds like an old hymn. Pretty simple. And that's all we have to do. They cross over. Which means this. We have, in the New Testament... We know that we've crossed over from death to life. So we have been set free, just like Israel, 
when Christ comes, there's references for you to look up. We get a chance to now go and to live not only free, but abundant. Abundant in all that God has for us. And secondly, as a result of your freedom, there's never any looking back that should ever play because there's no condemnation. There's no condemning influence in us like there was in Israel to keep looking back. We're nobody. You have to understand that in Christ, all of the things, as Paul said, that you would like to do, that you find yourself, eh, that influence that would say you're a bum, you're worthless, you're, you're insignificant, it doesn't matter, none of that plays out in you. Because in God, through Christ, he doesn't condemn you. He looks with unbelievable love for you. You think Jesus doesn't understand humanity? You think he doesn't understand what knotheads we really are? You think Moses didn't get the fact that these people are stiff-necked? You think by chapter 18, after the Ten Commandments, you think he didn't get it? All they did was complain. Matter of fact, he's going to come to a place where he jeopardizes his own life because he's had it up to here. He beats a rock, and it disqualifies him. He knows all of the condition that we are, and yet he still loves and cares and comes and delivers and breaks that cycle of poor living in order that we must now serve the Lord, not self. Never let self become a God. Don't look to yourself Always look to God. The story that we're going to launch from here now is going to be this continual struggle with Israel, always looking inward instead of upward, looking to God. And the same thing that we have to deal with, guys, is we have to always look to God to trust him and resist the temptation to grab the steering wheel and say, I got this. I got to do something. You know, it's T minus almost no time. Any kind of decision is a good decision. And what do we usually find out about those decisions? Yeah, like stupid. Yeah, stupid. So fight that. Stand, block, get in the way of the old man so that the cycle never repeats and never think the grass is greener back where you came from because it's not. Fight the temptation to make the decision to go back. Always remember, in Christ, we move forward, not backward. Amen? Bless him. Father, this morning, we realize that the story here of Israel is very close to what we deal with. There are some things that create great fear in us great uncertainty. There's a great temptation when the world comes chasing after us. When the old ways of life, the old cult wants to to draw us back to enslave us again. Things like disappointment become springboards. Fear anxiety, worry, real pain, real hurt. Lord, when real life hits and hits hard and it feels like there's never a way out, you always open up a way. This morning it was a sea. For us, it was a cross. In both instances, we walk across. And it becomes the journey into the place of your rule, the place of promise. And so, Father, this morning, I'm just asking for everybody here that has a real need. That, Lord, that you will meet that. That, Lord, the people that are struggling with cycles of behavior and habits, that, Lord, once and for all, they can be broken. 
And for the person who's wondering whether or not God can rescue them, that, Lord, that you would speak to their heart and remind them that you specialize in great rescues. All we need to do is stand by and watch. And so, Father, as we leave this morning, may we leave in your peace, in your patience, in your presence, in our faith. And so, Father, as we leave, I just pray your blessing over each and every person. And, Father, I just pray that the Lord, you, Lord Jesus Christ, would bless and keep all of us this morning, that you would cause your face to shine upon us, that you would be gracious to us, that, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit that would continue to lead and guide us as we're on our journey into the promised land. And so, Father, I thank you that your peace is one that guards our hearts, it guards our minds, it guards our steps. So, Lord, we thank you for that, and I pray that into each and every life, not only for today, but, Lord, throughout this week until you bring us back next Sunday as we continue to look at the journey of Israel as they will just stop and begin to cry out in their praise of who you are and what you've done in their life. May you do that in ours as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.